Defining your problem, improvement and project team are a super important first step in any improvement effort. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And this is the first of the five phases of the MAIC. So in this little video series, we'll go over each of those phases in some more detail. And you will also see that all of the phases of the MAIC, they have sort of sub steps and the tools that we use to get around and make sure we have the needed data to really do our improvements in a proper way. Now, this one on the define phase, it will sort of end in a team charter, a project charter. That is also something that my friends over at Belt Course, they have put together a really nice interactive course where you can practice this and practice it in, in a live way with direct feedback. So if you want to learn how to do this, get good feedback, hit the link down in the description below. But now let's also get into what that define phase is. See, the main goal is to get clarity on what we're gonna do, right? The goal of your project and to get the resources for it. But to get the goal of your project, we should define the business needs, the customer needs and our process in general. So that together will bring us to project goals and resources. This is sort of the, the end cap of our D define phase. Now for the business needs. So what, what does our business need? Quite often we say, you know, start with the customer. But no, start with your own business. What, what do you actually do? What do you want to improve? You can go out to customers asking them, you know, what new stuff you want on their iPhone or basically what wonderful stuff they want and they will say, I would like a better iPhone and you work in a cookie factory. It doesn't match, right? Your business actually does come first because you already have sort of a path that you set up. So when we check what the business needs are, We are looking for things like a problem statement, right? Something has not, you know, not been happening well, or it, it has been a problem for consumers or something the business wants to solve, or just a performance indicator, right? A key performance indicator that the business really wants to improve. And they feel that there is potential in the process that they're sending you after. And so those type of things, a good, clear problem statement from management, from R and D, or, clear KPIs and KPI targets, or at least sort of wishes. That is the start from the business side. Not too deep into the tools, but very important to get that on paper before. Then when we look at you know, customer expectations or uh, customer demands or customer satisfaction, there are a couple of tools that we often use for this. Um, I'll put two on the board, but know that there's, there's just a couple of different ways to sort of do the same. So there's the, the CTQ, critical to quality. These are uh, product factors that are critical for your customer to, to like your product. So liking your product, that is basically quality, right? You can say, you know, especially in food, the quality should be that I don't get sick out of it. True, but that's only one of the aspects of quality. The Kano model goes into that a bit more. The Kano model and the uh, quality function deployment and the house of quality, they are very similar in their approach. So the Kano model, it uses things like, uh, this is a customer's expectation. If you minimum expectation, if you don't meet it, they will not like your product. Then there is a couple of things that they're sort of indifferent about. Uh, there are positives that are uh, direct positive, the more you have. Uh, the happier the customer will be. There is sort of a, uh, a positive that if you have it, it will add a bit. And there are negative things. If you have this characteristic, customer satisfaction will drop. House of quality, uh, quality function, they use very similar ways of thinking about that you have different types of quality factors and not getting sick from a piece of food. That, of course, is one of those well, sort of minimum requirements or even a negative thing. Like if there are nasty bacteria in your food, that is a serious quality problem. While a nice taste is 
going up in customer satisfaction. So what we do for that is you want to usually, especially if you're talking the entire production chain and you're talking sort of your entire business, you go out and meet your customers. So you do focus groups for this. You have a good discussion and you do market research. There are bureaus that will also do this for you, but you need to uh, instruct them very well on what specifically you need. But then you also do shop visits, house visits, the consumer experience, right? That is what you want to get inside of your company. You can also ask a number of consumers to just come to your factory and come to your development department to share their experiences. Really good to understand that many consumers actually use your product in a completely different way than you first intended. And that will lead to new insights. But there is one thing here. So if we are working somewhere early in the process in the business to business industry, right? which consumer? The consumer is not always, so actually I should say the customer is not always a consumer per se, right? The customer can also be the next factory in the production chain or even the next department in your own internal logistics or your finance department. Although I think the finance department should consider themselves more as a service provider, but for certain processes, the customer of the process may actually be some department. It's not really about your physical product that you're making and the final consumer that is using it. It can be some other person or department. So keep that in mind when thinking about this customer critical to quality elements and especially to the way how you get the information. Then we also check the process. So we want to know what is the process that we use to deliver that value to the customer. Where should we look for possible improvements or pain points? And what is the scope to begin with? For that, we have a, a couple of uh, pretty good ways to, to check it. And here is where a value stream map or a process map really comes into play. These are not really analytical tools. These are ways to describe your process. So that's why you see them so early in the domain, already in the define phase. For some problems, especially more lean type of problems, a VSM may be useful also later when analyzing. You do this current state, future state, and the bridge state and stuff like that. But if we're talking the make type of projects, a value stream map or a process map, they come relatively early. And quite an important one that also uh, is, is underused, I would say, is the sidewalk, which is a specific way of looking at your process. So the P here is your process, then you have your customer and your supplier. And how do we get things from them? So the inputs and the outputs. What is the input that the supplier gives to the process? What is the output that the customer expects? And you can do this over the blocks in your process or value stream map. Say so what is actually happening here? What are the handoffs from one process to the other? It's super used in Lean. If we are looking more at a uh, process variation improvement, we still want to know what is actually coming in and going out and where is it coming from? So this is sort of a, an expansion on your process map that will give you much of the needed detail. And remember, when we do a DMAIC, it is generally to improve a process that has already been at a certain level for a long time, or we have sort of exhausted other ways of making quick problem solvings or improvement gains. So take your time to really map out what your process is like and who are the actors there. And then, of course, when we combine all of this, we get to your project goals and your project resources. So we get to the project charter that states what the project's about, how far we want to go in the KPI, who's in the team, what resources do we have, roughly a timeline, things like that, who the sponsor is. So put your team and your resources in that charter as well. Define it here, because if you are going to have to be asking for resources way down the line, 
and it's going to drag out your project. It is better to have a sort of a conditional uh, okay, a conditional approval before. And this will probably cost 50,000. Of course, if we see along the way that even the 50,000 investment is probably not going to solve the problem or increase the performance, we will not do it. But you know, get that pre-approval of if we can prove that it will work. Is it okay to spend 50,000 this year? Because in many companies, such investments need to be you know, okayed or at least budgeted upfront. Otherwise, you're not going to get them. But also, your team members. Right? If you're going to ask for uh, at least four, preferably eight hours a week from somebody over the course of three or four months to really do good analyses and really do good improvement, that is quite an investment. So not only does the company need to be okay with spending those man hours because they're not free, but they almost always need to organize something to free up the time because you're not suddenly going to add Sundays to your work week just because you have a project, right? That is not a sustainable way to do improvement projects. So something needs to be changed in the work organization of probably most of your team members. Real important to get that into a good charter. That is also what we can you know, train and uh, practice with feedback through an interactive type of workshop, which is what beltcourse.com offers as a nice package where you can really go through the define phase, sort of light, and then really focus on how do you write a good charter. This will be a valuable skill also for problem solving teams, also for small improvement teams, definitely for these bigger domain teams or other larger project teams. And if you do this purely by reading a book or watching videos to get the theory, you have not practiced it yet. Now, what Belt Course does is they give you a bit of theory, of course, but then you are going to write it, defend it, think about it in a group with direct feedback. So you get to think about those questions and practical problems that you will hit at some point down the road when you do it for real. And then the book will not help you, but this course will. So go over to beltcourse.com uh, through the link below. I hope I will see you back in the next video. That will, of course, be on the measurement phase. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. Let me know what you thought about it and good luck in defining your project. But as always, don't forget to also enjoy the continuous improvement process.